you're good. I can see people logging on. I want to welcome everyone. We're going to hold off just a few minutes while everybody is on the webinar. If you're just joining us, I want to welcome you. Um, we're going to hold on just a minute while giving people a chance to log on. Good afternoon. I just want to say hello. We're going to hang on just a minute or two more to give everyone a chance to log on. Thank you. Okay, I think we will get started. Um, I want to welcome everyone today to this program, Momentary Joys, a conversation with artist Hank Pander and curator Bruce Gunther. I'm Judy Margles. I'm the director of the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I'd like to thank our partners for the program, the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust and the Jewish History Museum in Tucson. This is the first of four programs that we're hosting together and you'll be able to find information about the other three on our respective websites. So for everyone joining in from California, Arizona, Oregon, or wherever, I hope that you are staying healthy and safe. We all now live in suspended time, isolated in our own thoughts and imaginings. In this time of chaos and confinement, we are reminded that art provides empathy and perspective. I'm thinking of the emergence of artists like Picasso, Duchamp, Brancusi. These are artists who reacted to the turmoil of first pre-World War Europe and created art that reflected the aspirations of the modern world. Or artwork created by Jews in ghettos, concentration camps, or in hiding under Nazi rule, which today we view as documentation, witnessing, and resistance. These are artworks that play an important historical role as evidence from the victim's perspective. It is really from this place that I wanted to speak to our two guests today, Hank Pander and Bruce Gunther, to have them reflect about art and what it can offer us during this crisis. Momentary joys that help us get through confinement, whether you are making art or experiencing art. If you have questions, and I hope that you do, please put them in the Q&A tab, which you're gonna see at the bottom of your screen. So with pleasure, I'm gonna introduce our two guests. Bruce Gunther is currently the adjunct curator of special exhibitions at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. Most recently, he was chief curator at the Portland Art Museum and also served in curatorial roles at the Seattle Art Museum and the Museum of Contemporary Art, Chicago. Bruce has organized monographic and thematic exhibitions related to artists and cultural forces shaping contemporary art internationally. He has written extensively on the art of the last 100 years, is a popular, popular lecturer on contemporary art and a frequent juror for regional and national exhibitions. At my institution, Bruce has organized exhibitions of Grisha Bruston, R.B. Kittai, Mel Bachner, and is curating a Nancy Sparrow exhibition 
now rescheduled to open in June of 2021. Hank Pander was born in the Netherlands in 1937. He was three years old when the Nazi occupation of that city began in 1940 and eight when it finally ended in 1945. Hank grew up barely 10 miles from Anne Frank's hiding place. His artistic character was shaped by the academic training he received at art schools in Amsterdam, as well as by the Dutch tradition of painting with its devotion to representing the visible world. Hank's work has been the subject of many solo exhibitions, including the Portland Art Museum, the Fry Art Museum in Seattle, and the Haley Ford Museum in Salem. An exhibition that had been scheduled to open in the Netherlands, entitled A Tragic Journey, this past April, had to be postponed because of the pandemic, but Hank had just told us that the work has finally been hung, so we hope that exhibition will open soon. His work is held in many public collections, including the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. So we're going to frame today's conversation around some of Hank Pander's paintings and the way that they capture and extend our imagination and experience. So the first painting we're going to look at is called Love Letters. And if we could get that on the screen. It's a studio painting. It shows love letters that Hank's parents wrote to each other during the war. And I'm going to turn to Bruce first about this, uh, this painting. What did we learn from it? Just talk a little bit about what we learned from the painting and then back to Hank to talk about your motivation in painting it. Art is always a form of human intelligence. And in this painting, we see its power to open personal emotion that comes from the imagery and the ideas. The tables scattered with unopened envelopes, letters half revealed, images, a context for us to project via the title into the import of the letters. There are two surfaces, red and a golden yellow. Are they the two people who wrote back and forth together daily? We don't know, but we can project our own feelings about this historic form of communication and love. It's, for me, always been one of the most poetic images uh, that came out of this group of letters that Hankin inherited because it opens the door to my parents' correspondence, to my correspondence as a young blade, to the, and maybe to the digital notes I get from people today as they reach out in the isolation of COVID. Hank, I, I, I was um, lucky enough to actually see these letters, um, the actual letters, and I remember you showed me one uh, that your father had sent to your mother and he had depicted this sort of these stick figures which he described as fascists that he was looking at from his window. So I know these letters are just full of war stories. So you paint, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to paint this image of these letters. Well, it's, it's, not, the, it's not the first painting I've done of these, of these letters. I got, I got these letters after my mother uh, passed away, the, um, whatever residue that was left in our family home in Harlem uh, was divided between my nine brothers and sisters and myself. So I, you know, got one tenth of whatever residue there was. And among which was this old suitcase and it was filled with letters. And one of my sister, one of my sisters who was sort of responsible for dividing things up said, why don't you take these with you to America? Because I'm, you know, that's all very personal and you're the elder. So, you know, probably some of these people mentioned in his letters and I feel somewhat embarrassed about some of the content of it. And I don't really want everybody to sort of, you know, grab around in it. So why don't you take those with you? So I got this little suitcase and it, actually the little suitcase is in the, in the painting behind a pile of letters. It's just a little, uh, suitcase and they were all in there and as I counted them there were like I think there were like 879 letters mm -hmm. there was also letters by my grandparents and my aunts and all there was just this incredible document and my my father was a uh, graphic designer for Johan Enschede 
which is a famous printing house in Harlem. My, my mother was the youngest daughter of the of the uh, village blacksmith in town. She was very pretty, and they met each other. And my father proposed that they would start a correspondence. My mom had to sort of think about it. My mom was only like 18 or 19. And they started the correspondence. My father living in Harlem and my mother living in a village, which was probably about 100 miles away. And so in order for them to communicate, they wrote each other. And they wrote each other every day. And uh, they started writing in 1932. They quit writing each other in 1937, and to my own amusement, that the result of all that passionate writing that there, there was their firstborn son, <laughs> which is me. So I thought, you know, these letters had sort of like I was already in there somewhere. And so, anyway, the letters were, you know, it turned out my parents were young. It was before they were married. So my, my mom was like maybe. 20, my father was 23, and they were extremely revealing about who they were as, uh, as, as people. I learned more about my parents out of the letters than I, mm. and then, you know, it was just sort of like they were already completely formed in there, and it was just a very powerful. And at the same time, these letters were all written shortly before the Second World War, sort of in these letters occasionally there were kind of like hints about what was about to happen, uh, you know, just a couple of years later. What was also remarkable in these letters, I'd open one up and uh, like a letter by my dad to my mother and it had a little card in it and I'd, and I'd open it up and it had a little drawing of a design of it of a 1935 Citroën, a French automobile, all in style out of that period and, and it had never been looked at and it had it had these moments of real period to it also it was just a very uh moving document and of course in the time nowadays with you know email and and letter writing has become kind of an antique art so to speak it also became kind of a, a peer a, a real period deck document and a very very personal one and i thought they were difficult to read. They wrote each other every day, and my, especially my mom, she was busy and helped my you know, grandparents and all that. So they, they sort of whipped out these letters in, in, in Dutch, in Frisian, because they were originally Frisians, and they were written by hand and sometimes extremely sloppy. So a lot of them were like practically legible. <laughs> um, so could, well, I, could I turn, uh, or go ahead, Briggs. Well, you know, Parts of the quality of the the different hands, the different stamps, the inclusions carries in this painting, and it's it it is the power of the rendering that animates the viewer's response and gives us in these times a window into origination myths. This becomes the point at which Hank, as an individual, as the firstborn child, sees his parents moving to each other and establishing the love that will create their family and the life he will understand at a fulcrum point in history, just before the World War II breaks out, the country is overrun. It is, it is in that regard, both a personal history and a moment for all of us as we reflect on our own lives to discover that point. This is why our parents often destroy letters before their children find them. So for Chris, the fear. I... Yes. Well, I wanted to push you a little more because um we're experiencing this painting and we might not actually, we don't know Hank, perhaps we don't know Hank's background. So help us, help us just appreciate this painting now for what we're seeing in there. How does one, how does one come? I mean, it, it's a sumptuous painting. The flowers are beautiful. The letters are intriguing. Um, say more about as a curator, how we interpret this painting. Well, it's a very dynamic composition. You go 
you enter the painting in the lower left corner and the, the, the display of the letters against this folded red cloth, your eye is drawn to the next pile of letters and then to the valise in which they've been found. It's backgrounded by what appears to be an almost oceanic blue with a yellow horizon at the top. Well, the, the promise of light. About the, about the landscape was that I was sort of working when I would painted at a time that, you know, I sort of, I mean, sort of following like astronomy and, and you realize that we, we live like basically in an infinite wilderness through the, that, that civilization and culture is just a very, very fragile, uh, you know, ephemeral thing nearly in the fast wilderness in which, we, in which we exist. So I, I put a sort of Martian, sort of alien kind of landscape in it in which this, this kind of cultural uh, still life is kind of inserted. Right. I think time, that carries yeah. that sense of the vast space behind. Uh, it's almost, as is often the case in Hank's paintings, because he's a history painter and he, he constructs a painting in the context, multiple layers of context, we experience it as the foreground. And then your eye, when it finally reaches the background, reaches that it's a vast exterior space in which the interiority and the meaning of the correspondence has to be found in your own mind. You begin to imagine from the beauty of the flowers between the letters, this kind of notion of love that blossoms between these two poles of the paintings. The vehicle that brings it to the present, the valise, we, we understand, but we don't know as intimately as Hank, who, who was handed this by his sister who carried it to America and in mm -hmm. opening it, the scent and the sentences of the past exploded and it became an important motif at that time. I, you know, it's, its beauty is in both its physical aesthetic construction and then the symbolism and the metaphor of everything inside mm -hmm. the painting. Um, so and I think the visitor understands that. My mother loved yellow flowers and my father for a while was painted like flowers for the, we lived in a tulip growing area and he used to paint like um, brochures for the flower growers around in Harlem. So there's sort of the flora element also not only references to like the kind of still life paintings I, I grew up with as a child, but they also I had a kind of a reference to both my parents. And that made the painting, makes the painting also personal and the whole painting as a whole, you know, it's in the studio and it's really kind of a conversation with recognizing and remembering my parents and, and being here in America and thinking about who they were and, uh, and, and, and my life as I left it in the Netherlands and all that sort of real personal kind of emotional element is also enveloped in this rather formal thing. Well, let's move forward to the next painting, which is a much more literal depiction of the war. So Hank has made many, many memory paintings of his childhood in wartime Harlem um, and everyday life under Nazi occupation. Hank, of course, you've been profoundly affected by this history and about this painting, which is called The Floor, you um, said that you, you, you tend to make these works from a child's point of view. Um, can you talk a little bit and you know, tell us a little bit about your wartime paintings and how conflict has motivated this work? Well, yeah. Um, in in uh, the mid eighties, I had a commission to paint a painting uh, for Oregon State University, a large mural, and it had to deal with World War One. And I, and I, one of my, the same sister who gave me the letters actually was in, with a ship and was right there in these battlefields in Northern France around Verdun. And I thought, what if I look around these France landscapes and see whatever I can see 
in the French landscape, which is still a reminder of the war without painting like a battlefield. And so I went down to Northern France and I had a little book called The Michelin Guide to the Battlefields, which I bought here in Portland and it had all these little pictures in it of all this shot up towns and trenches and helmets and horrible scenes and all that, but I followed all that. And it was an extremely moving experience to being in these battlefields and it just and it rained and it was sort of you know, just really depressing but it was also an incredible powerful experience of experience the landscape which had that conflict sort of really imprinted in the landscape and the French had the grace to leave it like that so in that period I went to thought I take a break I think I'm going to go make a little trip excursion to Paris and I went to Paris and I went to the Musée de l'Art Moderne in, 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 in Paris, and there was a big exhibition of a painter, it was, this was in 84, of a German painter called Anselm Kiefer. And Anselm Kiefer was a post-war artist who had painted these massive paintings of about the sort of more of the symbolic paintings about the history of warfare, within German culture and had made his paintings which refer to a kind of symbolism in, in Germanic culture, which were, uh, of which he did this very large, very operatic, huge paintings. And they spoke to me in a sense from, I'm actually doing very something very similar by roaming around these battlefields and being confronted with it. And, and, and also I thought, finally, there is a painter, a painter I can actually really relate to as an artist, a European painter who really deals with the world as it is and it was. And so it was just made a deep impression. And when I returned to the United States, I sort of wondered whether uh, war had imprinted itself, whether there was a sort of residue in the American landscape, whether there were imprints in the landscape here which were sort of similar it made me look different at landscape and and i started you know explore exploring that in fact i went to hanford nuclear reservation which is close here and it studies at hanford for instance while i was doing that i was thinking from why am i drawn to this subject so much and i thought it is because of I remember the war and I remember it very well. And I living in America and America was continually perpetually involved in one kind of form of warfare to another. So it also had to do a little bit about living in this country as a immigrant, being confronted continually by this country, which is involved in this violent activity. And so I thought, he well, talks about the symbolism of, of the war, but this is what happened. It happens to people. It happened to us. And I started Bruce, making drawings about that. Bruce, you wanted to chime in Well, there? so which, which is the entry point for this very theatrical painting, The Floor, in which people are hiding under a fake floor or between the floor and the ceiling. Yeah, this is... As this Nazi troops are breaking into a bedroom or something, into a, a domestic setting. This comes out of your, the narratives of your childhood and the stories you heard and the things you witnessed. I had and a little friend, yeah. His name was Adi, and they were a big family down the street. And they were, they were young men, and like my parents' age, and they were involved in the resistance and they did sort of underground work. And then later on turned out the, the, the designer the, the, the contractor actually built hiding spaces in people's houses. So if there would be a raid, then they could hide out in these houses. And so, this, so that in this house of my friends there, there was a Nazi search. The Nazis came in and they were looking for people. And what, that, what had happened, they lived in an upstairs apartment. And then people would hit underneath the floor, in between the, the floor and the ceiling underneath. And they had to be extremely quiet. And then the woman in the house would lie in bed and pretend to be sick and said, oh, I'm really sick and don't get in the bedroom and all that. Well, these mm -hmm. people were hiding in the floor and any kind of noise they made or sneeze or whatever, they, they would be caught and stuff. And occasionally soldiers would like shoot. They knew that. 
and so they would actually shoot through the floors in the in the in the hope that it would be people in there they could kill or so. So that that was sort of the the narrative for for this painting. This is, I remember that really well. That these well, things happen. And, so and it's it, it's very effective in this painting, where you get that 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 diagonal back in space to the lit corner of the bed and the armoire, the soldiers as almost silhouetted and looming above this figure who projects into our space from the edges of the floor and the ceiling in a very interesting way. It's, it's a dynamic thing. And the floor is a horizon, actually. So. Yeah, it, it, very strongly. And everything leaps up from that horizon, including this kind of not ominous sky outside the windows, so that the evil exists and the memory which is of fear is projected in a very beautiful kind of sobering way um but theatrical i it's this has always been a very interesting picture because of the blue orange dynamic of the color and the palette inside and also because hank this is a specific memory that you had in your house right it's, it's my friend's house, you know, down the street. Yeah. And I was friends with a little boy and I would be very, really close friends and stuff. So, um, and, and the painting itself is also kind of, if you think about the history of Dutch interior painting, like say Vermeer or Pieter de Hoog or so, these very formal rooms and, and this very domestic kind of piece. And here you have war where, you know, the, 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 the outside world, in a sense, the, the violent world violates the, you know, the peaceful safety of the, right. you know, of the home and stuff. And I, and I think that is really kind of a universal subject. So uh, the, the, the intent was to give a comment on warfare in general, and I used these memories as a kind of a metaphor for that. So, well, and what better metaphor than the the security and the refuge that the bedroom represents and then this vermeer like light raking across it and the war is present it's not unlike the next picture right which yeah, looks good is an empty street in amsterdam and and it's i find this painting it both incredibly beautifully painted which Hank's work always features this incredible skill as an artist making a painting, but there is this echoing emptiness of the street, of the windows, the clouds that break from very dark to bright light, the sun on the facade, but the fa facade itself ha is disrupted and empty. I, I, I saw this group of pictures, some of which are in the show currently in Harlem um, in the Netherlands. And I, it echoed for me a sense of loss, a sense of transference that the streets of New York must have today as COVID has emptied and isolated the city and, the, and its residents. Hank, do you um, want to Want to say more about the place and time represented in this work? Yeah, this painting, it's just group paintings actually. Huh, so it's sort of ironic uh, how this went with this painting. This painting is not in Harlem right now. The former painting of the interior, the floor, that is in that show in Harlem. Um, last year, um, I was, um, uh, like yeah, a little a year and a half ago, I was in Amsterdam, and my brother Peter and I walked through these neighborhoods in the eastern part of Amsterdam. And my brother remarked, "Oh, he said, you know, when the war was over, the streets of the Retief Street we walked through, and and he said, all these apartments in this house, on these houses in the streets, were all empty, and the, the streets were completely abandoned because this there was originally." a Jewish neighborhood and it was on the eastern side of Amsterdam and when the Nazis came in they they turned it into an enclosed 
area in the city and I hauled everybody out their houses and brought them to um, Auschwitz and people were murdered within hours practically. And that happened in that neighborhood for, you know, throughout the, from 1942 until, you know, the end of the war in 1945. And so, as I walked through the streets, I all of a sudden looked at the this, this streets in Amsterdam, you know, like it's all now nice cars and little shops and little, you know, gentrified and painted up and all that. I just sort of thought all that away and I thought, maybe when I get back to Portland, I'll do a series of paintings about remembering that time when the city was empty and the streets were empty and, and everybody was basically killed uh, because that's kind of a reality when you walk through these European cities that, that has this really deep kind of uh, and at times really extremely gruesome history and so I just did a series of paintings of these sort of of these empty streets in Amsterdam for also for me it was a way to being here in Portland but as I was doing these paintings be also be back in Amsterdam which is a city I dearly love. So, so I had the paintings had this sort of slight sort of uh, you know, decay to them, and 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 I, I left a bicycle in the middle of the street, as, as if something had flee or happened or whatever. So that has a sort of moment. And and now now these cities are again because of this virus also emptied out. So all of a sudden these paintings have taken on. This sort of double take in a way. Exactly. Yeah. Well, okay. exactly. I, I think that you've created a series of paintings that are witness to a history. You've stepped back to a time you remember, but an event you didn't realize was happening because of your your childhood and where you were, and they become in their muteness um, a powerful spur to the imagination of the viewer, to the, the kind of isolation that in the America, Edward Hopper practiced, where he would show semi-desolate landscapes, the hand of, of human activity present in buildings or storefronts, but without a narrative that we can uh, approach except through our own sense as viewers of isolation, of the hollowness. I, I, I think that this, this opens the door of where art can live in the present, how it provides us moments of insight, of inspiration, of a challenge to move from the experience of an image to our own experience and come back to right. a context that is historic, or contemporary and make meaning happen. It really speaks to the prescience of art artists, right? I mean, somehow yes. you had this ability, Hank, to create this painting when you painted it, but of course the parallels to social withdrawal today are innumerable. There is a question I'm just seeing, there, there are questions that we'll, we'll um, talk about later, but I do see a question we can answer now. Someone is saying that um, just, applauding how powerful and relevant the painting is for today, asking if the series is going to be shown publicly. This will be one of the paintings included in our show, will it not, Hank? Yes, yes. Okay, so we will, um, in February, all things being well, um, we'll be opening a show about Rembrandt and the Jews in one gallery, and we're going to be showing Hank's Amsterdam paintings in the other. So that will be February of 2021. Isn't that great? Showing together with Rembrandt couldn't be better. <laughs> I think Rembrandt should be pretty happy. I think he's, he's, just, he's dancing. Yeah. He's so happy. Uh, I do want to make sure we have time for questions. So we're going to move on. Um, we're really moving forward in time. You know, of course, at the beginning of my remarks, if we could show the next. Um, oh, uh, I'm out of order. No, you're not. Oh, no, I'm not out of you're, order. I, I'm out of order in my notes. I'm so you're sorry. Chronologically in order. Thank you. It's it's a uh, COVID blame COVID. Um, so if we are right for those of you not um, in the listening and not in the Northwest, you might not be aware that we're actually literally at the 40th anniversary of the eruption of Mount St. Helens, which took place on May 18th. 
it was a singular and mesmerizing moment for all of us who were here in the Northwest. Um, you see this amazing painting that Hank has created. The volcano is spewing, but Portland is really uh, bathed in light. This um, painting and others are in a show right now at the Portland Art Museum commemorating the 40th uh, uh, anniversary of the spewing of the, um, of the volcano. So Hank, what did you want visitors? When did you actually make this painting? What date? I wasn't sure. Well, what, did, what did you want visitors to get from it? Well, I don't know. I used to live there. This is painted from a place called Cable Street, and I lived on Cable Street for, for you know, a great many years. I like a funky little house. And, and I, in the yard, it was sort of in the hills. You look across the freeway and you look over North Portal and right, what was right in the middle there on the horizon was Mount St. Helens. Beautiful, symmetrical volcano. And it was always compared to Mount Fuji. In, so you in, painted this in 1980? I painted that painting. This painting was painted, I think, in 80. One or eighty-two. The painting so was from memory. It was memory. Was commission. I was commissioned to do a painting for the city of Portland, and I had started a program which was based on a program in Amsterdam, which they're called the Topographic Atlas, and it's here now the Visual Chronicle. And so the painting is sort of chronicling an an, an, an essential period in the history of Portland, and it just happened just shortly before that, and when. I moved here out of the flat, you know, rain-soaked, ditched, riddled Netherlands, and being surrounded by a huge mountains of volcanoes here, it was just really spoke to my imagination. It was enormous volcano. I'd never seen anything like it. And I'd always wondered from what would happen if one of these things erupts. Jesus. So then it happened. And so and there was ash rain, and it was just like it was just sort of fantastical. And and I managed to with us, with the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry to fly over it shortly after it happened. And I went into the so-called red zone where all these trees were blown over in this sort of area of devastation and made watercolors there and photographs. And I actually so I, because it, it was so unbelievable for me as a Dutch person to experience it, that's right, I did extensive documentation of that, including a series of watercolors and drawings and photographs and photo montages and this whole body work. And sort of out of that uh, came this painting because it was also like this, this explosion. But it was also in a time when, sort of around the time of Ronald Reagan, when I painted it, had become president. And there was like a confrontation with the Russians. And there was like talk about nuclear war and fallout and dense pack arrangements of nuclear missiles and missiles on trains. And, you know, there's just the film even about it where it scared the hell out of everybody. So, so it had this hint of also of like this massive mm. explosion. And it had this ash rains coming down, like, you know, like fallout and stuff. So it had this, this, it was sort of mixed up a little bit with the tenor of the times as well. So to me, it was just a very evocative and it was autobiographical because it was just that, this is was just for my house, you know, it was a scene out of my yard. And because it was such a media, media event, I put a little television set in it where you could see the eruption on a TV set and I also put the binoculars on it, so we sort of indicated the, the many different ways this event was being looked at and reflected upon. And so I put this mirror in it, which then reflected the whole scene as a kind of idea of the idea of reflecting it, thinking about it, what's the implications of it, and so forth. And as a, again, you know, with the with the virus at the moment, it's basically. Also, with that still life, we essentially live very, very fragile in an immense wilderness. In the, and nature really is indifferent; it doesn't care. And that element of the of the wilderness that, that although we have the civilization, but kaplow, there is a whole mountain explosion, and you know cities have yeah. disappeared. Yeah. So, 
So, anyway, Hank, I'm, I'm me, sorry to sorry. interrupt you. We're, I'm seeing so many questions from the audience, oh. and I, I want to make sure we get through the last two paintings. Um, so I'm, I, but I'd I really like Bruce to say to something say about something. this. Exactly. I, I want to give I'd Bruce like to, a chance. So forgive I, I'd me. I'd like to say something about the painting and the, the stasis that the picture has. You know, the palette blue into pink, very kind of pastel with these dark shadows. The, the ash cloud and explosion, which rose 15 feet, 15 miles in the air, and the cloud eventually was 35, 35 miles across. Here, almost like a personage of a, of a proud and threatening bird, but it's a cloud of, of material. The, this is a one-time event in which the artist saw a metaphor for a larger socio-political phenomenon that was encompassing the country. And, it, and yet it harkens back to that, the historic relationship we have with nature, that humanity, that mankind has with the forces of nature, a volcano, a hurricane, a flood, a tsunami, those things that alter the, the, in a violent way, in a moment, our equilibrium and our um, indifference to nature. Not unlike yeah. the activities of the war in which humanity battles itself and destroys the earth. Here the earth, in a sense, takes a step back and we have to, we understand our most primitive feelings, the fear of night, the ominousness of the wind in the trees in a stormy evening. And it was 8.35 in the morning, the side of the mountain blew open and our vista was changed, our relationship to the mountain changed. And for a year or more, people were sifting carcinogenic volcanic ash off their roofs and into their lives in the Northwest. And it changed volcanic science. This painting in its beauty, that almost pearl-like light that he's captured, one of the most violent physical events in the landscape of the Northwest in over 150 years, witnessed, digested, and reflected on, so it becomes a metaphor for our relationship. This is the power of art and the power of events in life to come together. Right, whether they're a singular event or over a period of time. Right? Exactly. All right, let's, let's move on. We all have to wear masks, too. I bet. So we're into um, the AIDS epidemic. Right. So this painting is called Waiting, Moment of Death of Rick Young, Theater Artist. There's so many questions that I do want to ask you, but I really want to make sure we have time um, for some questions. So I'm, 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 Hank, I do want you to identify the subject and the content here. But Bruce, you might just comment briefly about what, what did art, art do for the AIDS epidemic, right? Um, and you might... Yes. I think I'll leave it at that because, yeah, I'll leave it at that. So the, Hank, just the, put... The, oh, Bruce, go first then. Okay. The AIDS epidemic was a silent killer. It moved through society much as COVID is doing currently. It became a flashpoint for activists, Again, Reagan figures prominently as a political force denying the, the epidemic, the, the effect of AIDS publicly. And here in Hank's painting, the staging, this cold blue light, the red scarf, which echoes the AIDS ribbon that was developed by Visual AIDS, a gay activist group to sort of mark the passage of this disease, which was uh, ultimately affected the blood as COVID does. People standing around a, a body on life support, the window open, a sunset or a dawn, we're not quite sure. It could be either 
dusk or dawn, it powerfully evokes the thing that we are experiencing today. It, it evokes that moment in time and the death of an important cultural figure in this community. At the same time, it is universally that moment at which life leaves and the world is changed by the death of one person, of uh, 70,000 people. And I, th I think this parallel to the silent invasion of AIDS and COVID's quiet move from healthy individual so, and to healthy individual. That's a, a role of art that both of you see to respond. Yes. I mean, here, the response, you know, I think we all, you know, understand the response that, of artists to the AIDS epidemic. It was visceral, it, it was huge, we were aware of it. And, and you see that as, as art's role to be sort of social and political. Um, it's one of art's roles. It's, it's clearly artist. one of art's roles. And it is, Hank has always been an artist who uses art as, as, as a record, as a vehicle, as a voice, a partisan voice, an, a, the, a, rarely a neutral observer to the events that have shaped human emotion and life. And, and Hank, I know that um, you were in the room when your friend no, was dying. Uh, you, the, have, you have been in fire trucks, go, you know, you have, you have been at the scene in creating art and I, I'm really interested as an artist and a, uh, as a human being, what it's like to be sort of there capturing the moment. Well, it's sort of like a lot of paintings I've done. I, you know, I, I was one of the founders of, uh, an, 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 in, the, in the early 70s, a kind of, quote, experimental theater, alternative theater called Storefront Theater. And for about 20 years, it just bloomed out here. And it was a very influential. There were a number of people involved in that theater, you know, like New York actors and also local uh, theater artists. And they had started this little theater and I was, they had a kind of a conflicted uh, position with the art community out here, but that theater sort of uh, accepted me with open arms and I started really early on the signing stage sets out there, you know, like, for about 20 years. And one of the, one of the, there was like these various cultures within that theater. It was a, uh, was a traditional theater group. There was a gay component and there was a women's component. They ultimately, because of all the politics in the, in the theater itself, it sort of exploded. However, one of the, one of the theater artists, his name was Rick Young. He was just exceptionally talented and and extremely visionary and, and imaginative. And he always wanted to, he really wanted to do original theater, write his own scripts, and then invent this really highly theatrical, beautifully lit, dramatic, and fabulously costumed paintings. And I was drawn to that element of the theater. So the effect of it was over time, then I did probably about 25 stage sets over this period of time with, with the storefront theater. And I became actually, for a while, actually a set designer. I still occasionally do sets. Then when the AIDS epidemics all of a sudden hit the, the deck, um, a whole lot of people in the theater I had worked with for many years, they became ill and actually died. And it was there all of a sudden, I realized that there was this enormous amount of people in the art community all over who passed away in an in a kind of world where everybody kind of shrugged their shoulders and stuff. Oh well, yeah, well, too bad, you know, it's their own fault, whatever. And mm -hmm. so, then Rick Young, who I worked with so much, was terrified of dying. And, and he said, you know, Hank, we were actually doing Macbeth at the time when he fell ill. And and he, I went to the hospital, and he said. He sort of whispered to me, he said, stick with me, stick with me. Hmm. And so I said, I'll, st I'll stick with you. I'll, uh, you know, whatever. And so I ended up having power of attorney over my old friend, Rick, 
I had done so many pr projects with. And so since I had power of attorney, I really got this phone call. My wife, Dolores, is standing in, to the right in the painting. It reminded me a little bit also of an anatomical lesson by a Rembrandt. So there's a lot of these paintings have this sort of reference to Dutch painting in it. Mm -hmm. But there was a time where I'd be sat in this ICU room and I was, you know, Rick lying there completely incapacitated. Uh, un unconscious in his hospital bed, attached to all these machines, surrounded by all his friends. And there came a moment where the extremely cool Dr. Bob Lawrence said, well, you know, it's, this is really hopeless. Maybe you should turn off the respirator. Is that okay with you? And since I was the one who had to say yes, I was basically responsible for the moment of of Rick's dying and I had to sit there for seven minutes for to wait for his heart to stop sitting in this chair looking at the scene. Mm -hmm. And I walked out of there and this moment in this ICU room was ingrained in my face and I thought I'm actually I was really responsible for the moment of of death of this of my my old friend I had done so many shows with. And so I thought, what the hell am I going to do with that? You know, and just and I think as a painter, if, if moments in my life are so powerful and meaningful, then they become make a painting. And so turn whatever is meaningless into an artwork and give meaning to the random meaningful, meaningless things which happen in life and, and give them grace to make an artwork out of it. And so I called the uh, ACE doctor and I said, is it okay if you guys can set up this room and I can make some studies? And I spent a whole day in this ICU room and did the studies of all the equipment and all that. And then asked, you know, uh, Jan Powell, who's a director for a Shakespeare company and my wife, Dolores, and, and Rick's boyfriend and the doctor and everybody, they all came to my studio and then I painted this whole thing basically from life wow. uh, into this composition. So that's the that's the yeah. story. So it's Thank it's you. a rarely seen painting because yeah. you know, I can't hang that. Um, so that there there is a question from the audience about the size of your paintings which, that I want to get to in a minute. I, let's just let's just feast our eyes on the last painting in this series and then move to some um, questions from the audience. Bruce, I, I just see comfort in this painting because it is so beautiful. Do you wanna um, well, discuss you know, anything uh, before we go to questions? Yes, I, I mean, I wanna talk about in this, in this moment uh, uh, with the final image, which is a photograph of Hank's studio and a painting in process, a real still life in the left, the painting on the right on the easel, a still life behind it, which figures in another series of pictures around it. But it is that, that seeking of beauty and meaning in art that makes art the place we go to for a vehicle, a witness, a chance to step back and look. And the title of this is a memorial to the, to the painters of Harlem or a variation on that, in which the great tradition of still, Dutch still life is acknowledged and the rush and the beauty of spring flowers and the painting and the tulips that Hank's father originally painted that he has used in his vehicle all of his life. We find solace and beauty just as in the death of Rick Young and the ICU chamber, we feel the the end of life yeah. and the way it, the poetry of that isolation and transition can be conveyed by art. Thank both you. of them beautiful, both of them a historic form. It is why we come to art in times like COVID. Momentary joys, right? Yes. Let's, let's go to just a few questions. I think we could have done this forever and ever. So I, I thank you both for um, your eloquence and, and uh, tackling these questions. 
I, I think it's important actually, because people are seeing these images on the screen. Hank, just really quickly, these are very large paintings, right? I had a specific question about the size of the Love Letters painting, but the Rick Young painting, do you remember? Do you want to just- Well, I know. It was, works uh, on a very large scale. 80, 81 by 105 inches, to yeah. be precise. These are, these are very large. Um, we had a question about the violin in the suitcase of Love Letters, uh, the very first painting we saw for those of you out there, and there was the suitcase that the letters had come in, but there was a violin sitting in the suitcase. Yeah, there was a violin in it. That? Well, I pay, I have, I had this, I just wanted to sort of give kind of, you know, this sort of suggestion of like culture. There was also like images of painting, there was actually a Rembrandt painting in it too. My dad collected these things. My mother used to play music. Um, and I and I had this violin, and it was sort of to me also like the music of life, you know, the the the, the melody of of these letters, and you know? so it, it gave a kind of mm. layer to it in a way. So it didn't have any kind of deep meaning, but it it sort of enhanced the kind of cultural element of making art in a sense. Well, More and it's an important than painting. Yeah. Paintings. It's an important part of how your paintings continue to enrich themselves with cultural symbolism, with metaphoric objects and ideas. They take a specific inspiration, but they let the viewer discover, connect, and think beyond it. It is that critical thinking and the accessing of human intelligence in art that makes it a powerful tool for us to survive for us to for human resilience to keep finding the, its core in its heart and in art music drama painting sculpture it is why the paintings are so vibrant for a viewer who doesn't know your personal biography right. hank the amsterdam painting were you working from a photograph or from memory well, it's I'm, when I was in Amsterdam, I really wasn't there that, so I had my cell phone and I just photographed whatever. I just took a whole lot of photos with the cell phone, and then I went through these images, and I made, and then I made, you know, in, the, in my printer, I made prints of them, so I had this sort of funky-looking prints, and then I took these prints and then reinterpreted them. I stripped the cars. I I, in a lot of these paintings, I made it rain, so there's puddles of water in the streets. There's actually, in some of them, I had actually painted rainstorms in it mm. and reflections in it and stuff. So the, so the, 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 the source material became just that source material, but the paintings themselves became sort of, you know, really independent from the, the photo generated images. My preference is like with portraits and stuff or still lives or whatever is to either make it up or paint from life. You know, mm -hmm. I, like, I love painting from actually from life itself. So, um, but it's sometimes you have to sort of use ways to sort of go around it and still make things really look lifelike and imaginative. So they're basically imaginary paintings, but they have this sort of source on the ground where I was in Amsterdam and actually you could say this is the Weteringschans or so, the Retiefstraat or so. So, so people, when, if you show these paintings in Amsterdam, people would be able to recognize from, oh, that's right there, so. Yeah. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, just a, um, unfortunately, it's a, it's a complicated question, or a, an, um, but um, a brief answers, unfortunately. So the question is, you know, wondering, I think for Hank, and then uh, Bruce, I'm sure you have something to say about this, whether, you're indebted at all to Vermeer in the painting of the letter. So, the, of course, Vermeer's painting of the young girl reading the letter. You don't have a letter reader in your work, but perhaps the painter or perhaps we might be the implied viewer. Um, so the um, person who's posing this question feels that the quietness of the painting resembles the tranquil interior of the Vermeer. Were you thinking of Vermeer when you mm -hmm. No, no. Bruce, do you no. think of Vermeer with Hank's work? I'm very well versed in Dutch painting. And so there's a lots of reference to Dutch painting. And, you know, 
as you may have noticed that you know that I'm a classical painter and I feel myself part of a long history of painting so so you know and being an immigrant and living here so far away from my own kind of culture in a way that has probably maybe even made me more sort of recall and remember I when I was like right after the war like I was seven years old the paintings are there are came out of the bunkers of the Rembrandts and they were unrolled and hung back on the walls of the Rijksmuseum and father said let's go to Amsterdam I'd never been there I was a little kid and with, on my father's hand we walked all the way through the city of Amsterdam took the train down there from Harlem and we went to the Rijksmuseum and what I remember I don't remember individual paintings but I sort of remember his big paintings there as a little kid and this kind of warm red glow in these paintings this sort of you know the Jewish bride or you know these paintings which have this particular kind of light in them and this mm. warm sort of a romantic nearly kind of feel to them and that has basically stayed with me my whole life so so these kind of paintings and the beauty of them and how gorgeously they are painted and the fact that I was drawing these things and the humanism in these kind of works I think are timeless so so making paintings like this now is just as important we are just as human now as they were then and so in that humanity that's sort of like who we are as human beings we may have created like jetliners and and computers and, and a zoom but meantime we're also the very same people who, you know we suffer we cry we die we love we we do all these things and and they are and they make us human beings sure. and that's what we paint and that's what we make art about bruce i'm like the news broadcaster you have 10 seconds <laughs> anything you want to add uh, you know bruce hanks art <laughs> hanks art and <laughs> hanks art and art in general is about empathy and projection metaphor and symbolism in its most abstract form and its most realistic it is a place we come to in this COVID isolation to rediscover our humanity and reinforce our being. And it is a gift and it's available. And I, we hope soon to see those paintings again in person here, here. as Hank did as a small child after the war. Thank you both. What a, a wonderful opportunity for me to spend time with you on this conversation. This program was recorded. There were a couple of people inquiring about that, and we will post a link on our website. We'll uh, send a link to our partner organizations. I just want to give a last sincere thank you to the LA Museum of the Holocaust and the Jewish History Museum of Tucson, and we look forward to further collaborations. And I will give you a, an isolated clap of thanks to both of you. Thank you to everyone for joining us. Please stay safe and healthy out there. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.